Hello there. If you're interested in learning about how multiple regression models work, and in particular in this case, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about how you know whether you've got a good model or not, then you're in the right place. This is our 19th in the series, and we're going to think a little bit about evaluating regression models today. If you haven't been watching any of the earlier videos, then I'll just give you a very brief uh, reminder of what a multiple regression model is. We're in the world of trying to understand what uh, drives some outcome Y, and the way in which we go about that is by looking at the variables, the, the X variables which might cause that outcome. And in this particular case, we've got X1, X2 up to XK. We have some parameters, the betas, which give us, a once we can estimate the model, give us some quantitative measure of the impact of a change in, in one of those X's on, or each of those X's on Y. So that's the model. How do you know whether you've got a good model or not when it comes to doing these regression models? Well, the first thing to think about in terms of that is, is careful thought about the selection of the X variables. It really matters a lot whether you put the right set of X variables in your model. So when you're thinking about some kind of outcome Y, uh, you can uh, usually fairly easily think of, of an example of an X that might cause it, that might be of interest to you. But what you need to do is to make sure that you think of of uh, the, the, all of the X's that you that it might actually be relevant and just think through about what some of the implications are of including perhaps two X's that might be very similar to each other. Do you really want to just try and distinguish between those two X's or not? Many, many factors to take into account beyond what we can talk about here. But the, I guess the, the simplest two questions you need to ask yourself in terms of asking have I got the right set of X's is have I captured the main important factors with the X's that I've included? Are there some obvious things that would contribute to the outcome Y that I've not captured? Now, sometimes the answer to that question is, no, I haven't. Uh, there are some things that I've missed, which I, I wish I could put in my model, but I can't measure them. Uh, but if that's the case, that's fine. You can't do any more than what you can do with the data you've got, but you just need to be aware of the potential limitations there of the model. So, for example, if the outcome I'm interested in is something to do with a person's achievement in their school or university education, and I might have a bunch of X's on the right-hand side which tell us something about what school they went to and, you know, how qualified the teachers were and what the students' staff ratio was in the course they're doing and a whole lot of things about their friends, a whole lot of things you can observe in the X's. So I've got quite a lot of the main factors that you think might contribute to outcomes or parental uh, educational status or something. All sorts of things that clearly likely to be relevant in causing Y, but there's a there's an X that you'd love to include, which is how uh, motivated is a student to succeed? Um, because clearly that's a big factor in contributing to outcomes, but you can't measure that very easily. So that becomes an X that you'd love to put in, but you can't. So it just becomes a bit of a limitation of the model. So that's the first question. And the second question is, uh, should I perhaps rethink some of the variables that I've suggested for putting in the model? In other words, are they all actually relevant? And the hypothesis tests that you would have looked at in other videos are the way of doing that. If you end up estimating a model with a particular X and then you do a test of the hypothesis about one of these betas, this one here, for example, and you come to the conclusion that that beta K coefficient cannot be significantly different, for, be found to be significantly different from zero, that suggests that that X variable is not relevant. So a better model would probably be achieved simply by dropping that X variable out. Now, the, that's the sort of vague waves of thinking about a good model, but there are two tangible measures that we use to also help us to evaluate our models and also to sort of compare models across different uh, selections. We're going to think about those in the rest of this video. So to help us think about that, we've got an example, which is uh, where Y is the number of visits to the doctor and X comprises a bunch of, uh, that a person makes over a period of three months, uh, and X comprises a bunch of characteristics of that person, how much income they earn, their gender, how much education they have, and what time of year they were surveyed, whether it was winter, summer, autumn, or spring. So here's the results of this, which those of you who've looked at other videos will have seen before, but the two things that we haven't concentrated on before are these two things up the top here, the R squared, 0.0279 and the standard error of 3.757. What do these mean? Well, R squared measures the proportion of Y or the variation in Y that is explained by the model. So it's a, like a, well, it's a number between 0 and 1 and the closer it is to 1, the better the model. If you get an R squared of 0, you've explained nothing. So you, you've got no, no, no information in those X's that helps you understand why different values of Y occur. So in this particular case, 
you got 0.028. Now that's pretty low. Think about it in percentage terms, it's usually easier to think of a proportion like that, so 2.8%. So this says that this set of X variables here, education, gender, income, and the season of the year that you're interviewed, explains only 2.8% of the variation in number of doctor's visits people make. So it's not nothing. We did conclude before that the, the p-values for all, for some of these x's at least, are, are small. So in other words, these things like education and gender and season do matter. So they're still relevant variables. It's just that together they don't add much information. In fact, you know, less than 3% of potentially 100% of the variation. So whilst the model's informative, it leaves a lot unexplained. And that's not surprising because if you think about what the outcome is in this case, you've got nothing in this model about how sick a person is. And you've got nothing about their age. Surely those are two big factors. People go to the doctor more as they get older, for example. We don't have that in our model here. We don't have any information here about uh, you know, their recent history of illness, um, which is clearly a factor contributing to how many times they go to the doctor. So many variables which are probably even more important than the ones we've got here, which are left out of the model, uh, which would make the whole model a lot better. So in the meantime, we have a model that says something. We learn something about the impact of things like gender and income, as we've discussed in previous uh, videos, but we don't actually come up with a very powerful model when it comes to explaining the outcome why. A little comment about R squared that's just be, to be aware of. When you're talking about multiple regression models, you can always improve your R squared. Simply add more Xs. So I'm not going to tell you why that's the case, it's a bit, bit complicated, but just think about it that every extra X you add, no matter how stupid and irrelevant it is, adds a tiny, tiny bit of information that helps you to get your R squared to be slightly better. So that's sort of the intuition behind it. But So therefore, looking at R squared actually turns out to be not a particularly good way to decide whether to include a particular X variable. So you'll see in this model, for example, I've got a few Xs in here which actually are not statistically significant, those ones about income, for example. So how much you earn is not a significant factor in determining how many times you go to the doctor. If I took income out, it would make then sense therefore to re remove income from the model. It, it shouldn't be there. That would be a better model. But the R squared in that case would actually decline slightly uh, because it's a, it's a statistical property of R squared that that occurs. And that doesn't mean I've done the wrong thing by removing income. Clearly I should remove it. Uh, according to the p-value result, but the consequence of that is it's slightly smaller R squared. And the flip side of that, I could add in, as I say, completely irrelevant variables and they'll improve R squared a tiny, tiny bit. Uh, that doesn't mean I have a better model. So R squared is not to be used to decide which X is to include. You use hypothesis tests for that. Are they significant or not? Now, the other thing that we've got in our output here is the standard error. That number there, 3.758. What does that mean? Well, go back to the original model. and We haven't said very much about this thing out here. This is, as we've described, the error. So in a sense, this is the information we've got about Y, the Xs, and how much changing Xs affect Y. And this is the bit that the model can't explain. So that's the error. So the standard error that we've highlighted in our output is the standard deviation of that error term E. So if, and, and you might think, well, why do we choose standard deviation of that error term E? Well, remember what a standard deviation is. It measures the square root of the average of the squared deviations around a mean of some value. Well, in this case, the error term has a mean of zero. Your errors, if I draw my regression model, if it was just one X and one Y, my errors, represent the difference between the model, which is the line, and the actual values, which are the dots. Some of the dots will be positive and some of them will be negative. I have positive errors and negative errors. So the average of those errors works out to be zero. So the standard error is actually just a square root of the average of the squared errors. Squares and square roots going on everywhere there, so it's a bit of a mouthful. But what we're doing is taking all of those errors, all the gaps between the line and the, and the true data, taking those gaps, squaring them, and then averaging them. And then once we get the average at the end, we, we take the, the square root of that average to sort of get rid of, the, rid of the inflating effect of squaring in the first place. So that's what you're calculating. 
So if you imagine a graph like this, in this case, all my errors, my dots are very close to the line. So my errors are very small. So the small errors will be squared and then averaged out together and you'll get a very small average. So the standard error in this case is quite small. In this case, you've got a big standard error because the errors themselves are big. So the standard deviation of the error in the top graph is much bigger than the standard deviation of the error in the bottom graph. So it's a very useful guide to us in practical terms about how big the error would be if we use the model to predict a particular value of y. So in this case, we got rounded to two decimal places, a standard error of 3.76 doctor's visits per quarter. And notice the units of the error, standard error, are exactly the same as the units of y, because this is how much your prediction of y would be out by on average within the sample. So you need a little bit of a handle on whether that's a, a good model or a bad model. Is that, a, is that an accurate prediction or not? Well, we go back to the original y data and we see there that the average number of doctor's visits that people make is 2.28. So your average person goes to the doctor a bit over two times per quarter. And we're trying to take a few characteristics of an individual. We've picked a person and we said we know something about their education, their income and their gender and when we, what time of year it is. And we're going to use that information to predict how many times that particular person will go to the doctor. And when we make that prediction, we're going to be out by an average of 3.76. That's not great considering that the average value itself is 2.28. So, you know, we could be over by three or under, we well, can't actually be less than zero. So <laughs> you can't go any lower than zero for your prediction, but you could be over by three, four, two standard deviations up there would be about seven, an error of about seven. So that's not a very accurate model. Okay, it's a big error. So I guess the key point here is when you're asking, is this a big error or not, answer that question relative to the mean of y. If it's, if it's kind of big compared to the mean of y, you've got a big error. If, on the other hand, the y in this particular example was typically around 100, then to only get an error of 3.76 would be quite good. You know, you're predicting on average with your error of only sort of 3.76 out of 100. That's very good. But when the average of y is only 2.28, that's a pretty lousy uh, error. So it's actually really difficult with these few basic characteristics to predict how many times people go to the doctor. Not surprising. So remember when we're talking about this section on uh, data analytics, we're saying that there are two kinds of analytics at work. There's predictive analytics, which is all about predicting the unknown, predicting the future, or predicting a particular person's behavior. So what this is telling us is that this model is not very good for predictive analytics. And why might you use a model like this? Well, you might use it in the following way. You might say, okay, suppose I, I want to figure out how many doctors to have in a particular suburb. Well, I go and collect the census and other information about the suburb. So now I know how many males and females there are, and I know uh, their education level of people, and I know um, the income of people in this, in this uh, suburb. So based on that, I can use my model to predict uh, how many times different people will go to the doctor. Okay, and even for that matter, I can predict it at different times of the year using my seasonal influences as well. Well, the model won't be very good for that. So don't use it to plan how many doctors you need in a particular suburb or something like that. It's not very accurate for that purpose, particularly when it comes down to pr predicting the behavior of one individual. The model might predict, you plug in your characteristics into this and it might predict you're gonna go to the doctor twice. Well, you might, but you might go no times, you might go eight times, it, there's a whole lot of variation. That doesn't mean it's not useful because there's also the prescriptive analytics component. Prescriptive analytics is about understanding the dynamics of relationships between X and Y. And that's what we've used the model for in previous videos when we've interpreted the effect of things like income and education and gender. We've learned that there's a big difference between men and women, that there's very little difference between uh, the rich and the poor when it comes to doctor's visits. So in other words, if we want to target our public health campaigns, we maybe need to target men to get them to go to the doctor more. If we want to think about our health funding models, we don't necessarily have to worry that our mod current models are disadvantaging the poor because it seems like they get access to health services just as much as the rich. So that's all still valid conclusions to draw on average from this model, 
which is very important. It's just you can't then turn around and use it to predict a particular individual's behavior with any great certainty. So the model has its limits because of the, the limitations with the accuracy of the model at the individual level. Okay, so there's your second tool at your disposal, the standard error, and uh, uh, how it's used is, is important, but it gives you a pretty good handle on, on uh, for practical purposes, how well you're doing with your model. That's everything I have to say on this particular video, so I shall leave you there. <laughs>